In taking up such a problem as marriage and divorce, it seems only fair that we speak not from the standpoint of theory, but from such practical experience or insight as has been gained from over 40 years of working with people who have, among other problems, marital difficulties. Therefore, we are going to restrain ourselves from theorizing and work with such elements as experience has shown to be true. Now, it is, of course, definite that our experience has been within a certain general area. Therefore, perhaps we have dealt all in all with a more thoughtful, more responsible group of people than would represent a general cross-section of the American public. At the same time, if the thoughtful have their troubles, it is obvious that those less thoughtful will be even more seriously afflicted. In the course of years, the general trend or tendency in marital difficulties seems to have shifted. Until today, I would suspect that the principal cause of trouble is a central and basic lack of self-discipline. Through the years, our thresholds of personal control have lowered markedly. Under the pressures of luxury living, with ever greater inducements to a rugged individuality, we are less inclined to be patient with other people, thoughtful of them, and less inclined to assume long responsibilities uh, for which we see no uh, definite advantages. Thus in self-discipline, which begins in childhood and must continue through the years, we have the foundation of all enduring values. The individual who is self-disciplined is a better citizen, a better marital partner, a better businessman, a better in his responsibilities, to his friends, and to all of the levels of the community in which he lives. The undisciplined person lacks the ability to direct his own efforts. He lacks the ability to place reasonable curbs upon his own conduct. He is unable to weather the various storms of pressure that arise. In fact, today, we are producing a generation of people much too soft, lacking in all forms of self-control, easily over-influenced, too quickly depressed, too easily disturbed. Now, this may seem to be an exaggeration when we realize how very serious problems can become, and that sometimes even the greatest measure of patience will not do very much to solve them. But where we have, as at the present time, a divorce rate that is too large for common sense and public good, the divorces annually in this country are gradually rising to close to a half a million a year. When we realize also that a number, a considerable number of our people are under religious obligations which will not sanction divorce or make remarriage almost impossible, we know that there are many others who, if it were not for these restraints, would also seek separations. As each of these divorces influences at least two persons, and in the many instances several children, we may safely say that divorce is now a tragic interlude in the lives of some two million of our people every year. 
This is a very heavy toll, uh, much of which depends upon this factor of lack of self-discipline. Self-discipline should tell us all, very simply and quickly, that life is not easy, that things are not going to go well all the time, that we are going to be faced with situations that require thoughtfulness and patience and unselfishness and kindness and forgiveness. If we are deficient in the ability to administer these gentler phases of our character, we are certainly not going to survive the numerous shocks that flesh is heir to. We are going to find small difficulties magnified. We are going to develop into a neurotic over situations that 50 years ago no one would have paid any attention to. So we can go back and uh, consider the problems when I was doing religious counseling as a minister in the 20s and 30s of this century. We found that the average person who had marital difficulty came to seek strength to carry it better. Now, in some cases, this may have been a futile attitude, and it was, no, no question about it. But these persons believed that the primary responsibility in marriage was to preserve the marriage. They wanted to do everything possible to them to help to understand, uh, to overcome the weaknesses in themselves which might contribute uh, to the breaking of a home. Most of these persons were willing to go far beyond halfway in their effort to keep the home together. They were willing to sacrifice a great part of their own individuality, their own freedom, even their own peace of mind, if as a result they could maintain a better and more purposeful family relationship. In the last five or ten years, this attitude has markedly diminished. The individual today finds difficulties, pressures which he cannot face with the dignity. He finds the smallest flaws in other people unbearable. He has no time or consideration to consider his own contributions to the difficulties. He assumes that everyone should understand him and feels no responsibility to understand anyone else. He takes the attitude that a home is primarily a place in which everything should run well of its own accord, or as the result of a steering committee composed entirely of the other member of the family. He assumes, or she assumes, that things should go naturally well because the other persons involved went out of their way to make things as agreeable and comfortable as possible for the individual who is complaining. This attitude carries with it also a continual diminishing sense of responsibility for family as such. The Chinese philosopher Confucius pointed out that the strength of a nation lies in the unity of its homes. Uh, we used to feel that this simply meant uh, that the broken home was a contemporary disaster in the generation in which it occurred. I think Confucius meant much more than this. It is from the insecurity of the home the children must come without the adequate foundations necessary to build homes for themselves later. Thus, the broken home is the beginning of a chain reaction that may, uh, may endure or continue for several generations. All these chain reactions making it ever less likely that the homes of the future will be secure. We realize also that in various educational institutions where domestic problems have been considered as part of the educational program, there is a distinct improvement in marriage probabilities. 
those who have made in their school and college years a study of this subject, becoming at least generally aware of its facts and probabilities, these persons do better. It is therefore in, uh, indicated that ignorance is no blessing in this uh, department as in any other, and that things can be helped if individuals really want to help the situations to improve. In the last 15 years, the average American has become much more neurotic than in the past. He seemingly has not the stamina to resist discord. He finds it more and more difficult to keep his own temperament on an even keel. He finds arguments quicker to arise. He finds uh, personal in injuries or insults more difficult to forget. By degrees, he is becoming so supersensitive and hypersensitive that it is becoming difficult for him to live with anyone else and almost impossible for him to live with himself. Naturally, this type of condition gravitates against any form of permanent relationships between people. Another situation that seemingly has a bearing upon this is the tempo of our time in general. Uh, in the last generation, marriages endured because conditions remained very much the same. The individual could plan for many years in advance, and the probabilities were that these plans could be fulfilled. The person looked forward to a life very much like the life he was living at any given time or day. Today, these patterns of general support from society are also breaking down. The changes that are taking place in world conditions are reacting upon persons, injuring these persons' securities, taking from them all long-range programs, interfering with their hopes for thrift and saving and burdening them with ever heavier responsibilities. The costs of living have also had a very serious effect upon domestic patterns. And uh, one of the phases of this can be the education of children. We know today that it will cost as much to get the average boy or girl through college as the average man earned in a lifetime a hundred years ago. It is going to cost more in the future. It's going to mean that to meet the levels and standards of living as we know them today, provide our families with the conveniences, necessities, and especially luxuries, which they regard now as an essential birthright, the, uh, pa the parents must have greater sense of responsibility, more instinct toward self-denial, more willingness to work for others and for times which they may not even live to see. These feelings are not of the moment, for the individual today wishes to spend what he earns as he pleases, and the sooner the better. Advertising, promotion, theater, drama, motion pictures, all of these factors have added to the general insecurity they have added to the personal ambitions of individuals. They have complicated normal relationships. And they have disturbed profoundly millions of persons who have no solid ground of their own on which to stand. The individual who is integrated in himself is not easily over-influenced. But where this integration is lacking, he can be constantly moved from his basic convictions and set adrift upon a sea of circumstances, much too stormy uh, for his ability uh, to control. So in this problem, astrology can play an interesting part. Perhaps astrology in this particular instance is little more than a restatement of common sense. But it does tell us certain things that all persons should know, should understand, and should appreciate 
who expect to build lives with others or perpetuate some common institution which already exists. Without certain basic senses or feelings about these things, we cannot hope to achieve permanent security and permanent happiness. The home should be the one place in the world where values are secure. The individual with this personal security has much more probability of surviving the pressures of public life. Without some type of security, without some type of intimacy which is gentle, kindly, and understanding, it is very difficult to withstand the pressure of the world patterns under which we have to function. Astrology tells us, first of all, that every person is born with a character. He is born with a disposition, a temperament, a personality. And astrology does reveal, through long working with it, that the average person is not going to change his basic pattern. If he has certain deep-seated convictions within his own nature, certain policies, attitudes, certain dispositional intensities, these may be modified. Uh, these may be brought from a comparatively barbaric to a more civilized stage, but they will not be basically changed. Therefore, in all relationships with people, we have relationships with individuals whose individuality is just as important to them as ours is to ourselves. We are not creating relationships with images, with patterns, with thought forms, with projections of our own beliefs. We can invest other people with any type of characteristic we desire, but if that characteristic is not in them, this investiture will mean nothing. It will not result in any permanent the enduring value. So everyone starting out in life, in the home, in the family, in business, must gradually learn to realize that he is surrounded by persons, not masses. He is not an individual in the midst of a sea of mysterious universals. He is a person among persons. His friends are going to be persons. If he marries, he will marry a person. If he has children, they will be persons. If he has relatives, they will be persons. And when he goes into business, he will deal with persons. He will not deal with vast unknown potentials which can be anything he wants them to be. He is surrounded by unchanging values. He is surrounded by individuals whose ambitions, impulses, instincts, and appetites are as strong as his own or stronger. Thus, he is not in a world in which he can drift along and expect smooth sailing. He is in a world in which he must share, he must work with other people, he must give them the rights to their own ideas, he must defend his own principles, but he also must have the genius to discover when other people are more correct than he is, and he must have the willingness to adapt his own uh, personal pleasures and prejudices to such facts as he may discover as he proceeds. Each person is born with a nature is born with a degree of selfishness and unselfishness, a degree of self-control and a degree of lack of self-control. Each person has his own preferences in every area of life. He has his own beliefs. He has his own religious convictions or lack of them. He has within this person, which seems so much like other persons from the outside, which may dress like other persons, may follow the general habits of other persons in public life, he has to face that within this person 
that seems to be just one of many. There is always a uniqueness of some kind. And this uniqueness must either be appreciated in relationships or it will become an impossible pressure. So from astrology we learn that the common everyday values of life can be mixed and co-mixed into an infinite diversity of patterns. That in these patterns, in the midst of them, as a spider within its web, is the individual who has created this intricate patternry of his own life by the pressures of his own nature, by the intensities of his emotions, and by the directions of his mind and will. Here he is established. And in most cases, this establishment among Western peoples is hopelessly self-centered. It is self-centered because the average person does not understand how it can be otherwise. It never occurs to him to become non-self-centered. His entire concept of success depends upon getting ahead. His, his concept of distinction leads to actions likely to advance the individuality of self. So self is frightfully important. Now in religion in the older days, Nearly all great philosophies and religious systems advocated the development of unselfishness. Some way it was recognized that this self could become excessive, and by humility, by humbleness, by detachment from the tremendous intensities of self, the individual gained a certain reward the reward of being more adaptable, more adjustable, and more companionable with other people. If we take the horoscope of a person, we find that in this chart uh, there are certain indications. One of these indications may have to do with the vitality of that person. We begin to estimate how much energy supply this individual has. Is he going to spend his years in a very positive relationship with society? Or is it going to happen that after a while he is going to get very tired? And in this tiredness, give up perhaps not only many of his ambitions, but perhaps a number of his values. So we have to determine the degree of the life principle that is available to that person through his a span here. What is his physical health situation going to be? Health has a tremendous effect upon mental and emotional attitudes. And attitudes conversely, as we learn uh, from psychosomatic medicine, attitudes have a tremendous effect upon health. So we have a person whose life expectancies, whose vitality expectancies are going to affect disposition. The next problem we may consider will be the imagination of this person, usually invested in the moon. If this person has an extremely powerful imagination, he may develop into a great creative thinker or a great creative artist. But if this imagination is afflicted by restrictions and limitations of faculties, if it is adversely related to other elements of character, this imagination may turn into one of the cruelest of all emotional problems, and that is suspicion. It may develop jealousies. It may cause this person uh, to allow his emotional life to be led away into, ne into negative apprehensions of all kinds. Uh, jealousy can and often does become a very dangerous um, factor in the life of the individual. It can cause the most dangerous and tragic consequences and at least can lead to a long enduring neurotic reaction to daily experience. So imagination is very important. How has this imagination been trained? One of the ways we train imagination in our modern society is through disillusionment. 
The individual who perhaps had a reasonably well-organized imagination, but not much strength of will, has a series of unhappy experiences and becomes disillusioned. From that time on, his logical factors are repaired, and he begins to uh, confer previous uh, conditions upon future possibilities. He begins to consider negatively all things that can happen because of certain things that have happened. Another problem in imagination is that it loses all sense of realities. It causes an individual to look back upon a life that is far happier than the average and see nothing good in it. It causes a person to remember every misfortune he has ever experienced and completely forget the numerous happy and fortunate occurrences which he has enjoyed. <clears throat> Imagination, therefore, can turn an individual with only a reasonable burden of responsibilities into one who regards himself as the most afflicted of mortals and can see no reason why he should not feel that both heaven and nature are against him and have been from the beginning. In addition to imagination also, the uh, study of the horoscope reveals the nature of the individual's basic integrities, largely through the positions of Saturn. These integrities are the honors or the values that will not change. These values perhaps will uh, slightly uh, disappear or have a tendency to be modified during the intense middle years of life. But the values with which the individual started, which came up through his early life, are the values almost certainly with which he will die. He will finally bring them back again to determine whether he is basically conscientious, basically honorable, uh, basically reliable, whether he does have continuities of purpose, whether he is capable of powerful dedications to principles. These things are revealed uh, through the basic structure of his chart. Also from this chart will come his judgments, as represented largely by the planet uh, Jupiter. His judgments have to do with his probabilities of survival economically, industrially. Also uh, his judgments help him to build internal character. His judgments have much to do with his religion with his basic philosophy of life. They tell us whether he is going to be a serious person or a superficial one. Also, they will tell us something of the philosophy of life that he is going to build himself through the years, whether he is going to end as an idealist or a materialist, whether he is going to become generous-minded or cynical, whether he is going to be an easy believer or a skeptic. All these things are indicated by the position of Jupiter and the various aspects which it forms. If Jupiter has certain afflictions, this individual's judgment will always be bad. It is often the case with Jupiter that we have powerful ambitions and poor judgment. We have the individual also choosing poorly the level of values to which he is going to dedicate his life. He may uh, sacrifice the best part of himself for a psychology of success. He may sacrifice too much of health to worldly things, achieving them, finding himself too ill to enjoy them. Thus Jupiter has to do with his broad philosophy of life, has to do with the values which he will gradually build and intensify through the years and also to a measure whether he is going to be basically optimistic or basically pessimistic. Then also his drive, his power to achieve, his success in life. The continuance of his basic relationships with life have to do with Mars. Where Mars is strong, the libido is strong. Where Mars is powerfully placed and well aspected, the individual has the enthusiasm, has the vitality, and has the power drive necessary to assure certain advantages for himself. If this Mars is not controlled, however, he develops belligerence, and belligerence will destroy nearly every sensitive relationship that he has. 
It is therefore very careful uh, planning indeed which will enable the individual with a powerful Mars uh, to discover the difference between reasonable and unreasonable ambitions. It is hard for this powerful martial person to retire when the time comes and enjoy what he has. He puts off rest for the future, when in, the t in many cases his restlessness will never permit him to catch up to this future of peace that he longs for. Others take the attitude that they want to end this life in this harness of activity. They want to keep right on to the end, working, building, struggling, and if necessary, scheming a little. Mars, in any event, relates these more definite activities with which we are concerned. Venus bestows its beauty upon our lives. The powerful Venusian person is by nature an aesthete. He follows most uh, naturally the love of beauty, of order, of graciousness, of formalities. He is given to surrounding himself with pleasant and gracious environments. He seeks the cultivation of personal appearance. He seeks to uh, become more proficient in creative arts. He may be given to music or to painting or to sculpturing or to literature or the dance or any one of the many uh, aesthetic branches of learning. Most of all, however, the positive Venusian, the one in whose uh, chart Venus is strong and valuable, this person wants harmony. He is a peace lover and is willing, if necessary, to fight for peace. He wants it. He needs it. Nearly all of his discords and tensions arise from his struggle to achieve harmony. And sometimes he makes a pretty inharmonious situation of trying to get there. <laughs> also, because Venus rapidly deteriorates into luxury in an afflicted chart, we find the individual overly indulgent, overly concerned with the fulfillment of his appetites. We find him likewise too luxury-loving, leading to vast structures built upon wealth and authority. We find, therefore, uh, that as one prominent Venusian said many years ago, man has six senses, the five we know and the sixth sense, and the sixth sense is money, and without that one you can't enjoy any of the other five. <laughs> so this is a typical Venusian attitude, which accounts for the fact that under this sign, we, uh, or under the power of this planet, we have more uh, creative artists, bankers and stockbrokers than in any other sign. This combination of art and money seems to be strongly under uh, the Venusian tendency. This leads in the intimate relationships of life perhaps to too much extravagance, too much pressure upon money, uh, too much demand up, upon money for the gratification of sensory perception. This tendency it is revealed in the various degrees of development which we find in connection with Venus. Now, in the case of Mercury, we have here the kind of uh, planet that has to do with the essential compatibilities of people. If we have a good Mercury, we have an individual who in his relationship with people is a good sport. He is perhaps aware of the mistakes of others, but he's aware also of his own. The mercurial person who is well integrated has the capacity to overlook things. He has the capacity not to be deceived, but not to make issues where they are unnecessary. If, therefore, the mercury person is a highly evolved type, he will have a strong intellectual life he will be companionable on a mental level. He will be interested in interesting things. And he will be able to discuss, debate, and argue without too much bitterness. If, on the other hand, the mercurial, mercurial person is not so well in, in, uh, integrated, he is apt to become extremely fussy, uh, picayunish in his attitudes. He is apt to make too much of details. He is going to be too demanding and react too quickly to small things, hypersensitive uh, to defects that other persons would not even notice. He is also, in a negative sense, likely to become 
too demanding to, upon other people for small actions, uh, small indications of behavior. He is going to become a too word conscious. He is not going to give other people the benefit of a doubt. He is going to take everything they say too literally and become hypercritical. We have already suggested the relation of the moon to the imagination, so we have left three other factors that we have to consider. It is not common to find today a person who is truly and completely under the influence of Uranus. The true Uranian type we usually consider to be the highly eccentric person. Generally speaking, unless Uranus is very well aspected, very highly evolved, it has little to contribute to human relationships. It is always going to represent an unusual or exceptional uh, situation. It is going to break patterns. It's going to be difficult to live with because the people in whom it is strong are unpredictable. They are inconsistent. Uh, they are given suddenly to causes and then get over these causes equally suddenly. Uh, they are naturally humanitarian, and this is one of the heaviest burdens that flesh must bear, because these people are always trying to help someone. And when they get through helping them, the person is really in trouble. Uh, the uh, uh, well-intentioned type of Uranus uh, is not very valuable unless it is well-disciplined, well-organized, highly cultivated, deeply informed, and even under the best of conditions, most Uranian persons leave behind them when they go a quantity of unfinished business. Some of our Uranian presidents have left behind a century of discord, which others have been unable to solve. The Uranian person is therefore an individual of, of tremendous intensities, a tremendous imagination, usually of loyal and uh, self-sacrificing nature. Uh, but inclined uh, to go off on tangents which are difficult for other people under other signs uh, to meet uh, with quietude and peace of mind. So the Iranian person uh, is an eccentric, and in marriage uh, they almost have to be married to another eccentric or thing go, things go badly. <laughs> they are very hard for conservative people to get along with. The Neptunian individual is of a quite a different nature, also rather seldom met, because uh, the Neptunian becomes so deeply subjective in his life that he gains not necessarily a complete self-security, but develops gradually the tendency at least uh, to uh, retire into his own depths whenever problems arise. Neptune, therefore, makes these silent sufferers that are a great cause of discord to people who like to be more articulate. Uh, it is very hard sometimes to get along with the person who won't talk back, who will not get angry himself, who will not do the very things that we do, because uh, if he has better control than we have, he makes us a little ashamed of ourselves, and then we really hate him. It's very hard to work with these people because we can't get at them. They are very isolated in their ways of life. And your strong Neptunian often goes into religious orders, often departs from general worldly situations, and takes on a strangely detached, detached existence. If he is particularly well integrated, he may go strongly into mysticism and higher idealism and will become a very patient, thoughtful, but somewhat detached and uh, somewhat forgetful individual in matters of worldly relationships. But if he is afflicted uh, or has a Neptune that is not well placed, he is a person who has mysterious, deep pressures uh, which uh, he cannot control and which flow out from him to create to confusion and discord around him if he's not very careful. The Pluto person we know very little about up to the present time. But we suspect rather strongly that he is, again, more or less of this secretive type, that he has to do with deeper inner pressures of personality. 
and uh, that his uh, life is strangely affected from early childhood. Most Pluto persons in whom this planet is very powerful seemingly have been markedly changed by sudden events in early life. They are the persons who carry, perhaps more than any other group, the tremendous stamp of a favorable or an unfavorable environment as they grew up. They are almost perfect examples of what the psychologist calls the product of environmental pressure. Thus these people have been molded or moved often contrary to their original natures, and this in turn leads to conflict for which perhaps there is no obvious explanation. So if you take these separate elements now, and then you combine all of them into a still larger compound, it is obvious to any thoughtful individual that a person, and every person must have all these factors within his personality, that each person is a very complex structure, that he is one we cannot expect to solve easily. Nor can we expect this person to follow in any general direction. Two or three hundred years ago, the institution of marriage functioned very largely uh, on a military basis. Uh, the typical German home of the early 19th century had father as general, mother as captain, and the children were all private soldiers in the rear rank. Uh, there was perhaps one top sergeant, the eldest son, who was being groomed for high office. <laughs> if anything happened to father, mother automatically became general and was never lacking in generalship. She was quite able to take over the situation. It gave her the opportunity to extrovert that she may have waited for for 30 years, and she did a pretty good job of it. <laughs> this tendency, however, to the regimentation of families uh, resulted, of course, in an outward serenity which often covered uh, a concealed disorder. Most of these very well-regimented homes were not essentially successful homes. They were more successful in a time when they were generally accepted because we have always been servants of style. We have always wanted to be what other people were. And when everyone was regimented, we thought to be regimented the same way. Uh, this tendency, however, has gradually changed. And today the regimented home is a highly uh, debatable issue. It is doubtful if it even exists as we used to know it, unless it may be in less advanced social groups. But today the home is not regimented. In fact, it has gone so far off the deep end of lack of organization uh, that its condition is, is perilous and its boundaries completely indefinite. There seems to be no way of bringing it into the old arrangements that we once knew. Yet it must have some arrangement because today it is losing practically all of its purposes and functions. It is no longer contributing to anything. It is no longer even an economy. Things uh, have so changed uh, that uh, we have to begin to reevaluate uh, some of the patterns of home relationships. Everything exists for a reason. Nature in its infinite wisdom did not create human relationships merely from some arbitrary whim. Human relationships exist for one purpose psychologically and one purpose biologically. Biologically, the purpose is the perpetuation of the species, and to this end, nature has conspired in every form of life since the beginning of time. Psychologically, the purpose of the family or the home is education. Uh, psychologically, we are brought together in order that we may learn to advance common destinies. We are brought together in order that we may complement deficiencies in our own natures. We are brought together in order that we may develop certain virtues and unfold certain richness of psychological overtone within ourselves. The final end of marriage for each person is that that person himself grows through common relationships with other persons. 
The sacrifice that the individual makes to maintain a home is a form of growth for that individual. It is a symbol of gradually developing maturity. The individual who accepts no responsibility, desires no responsibility, and if he is forced into it, resents it to the end, this individual is a perpetual adolescent. The individual who wishes only to do as he pleases is the child mind, or at least we may say is extremely childish. This person is lacking in the depth of character and in the sense of responsibility which we all must have, to, must have in order to survive. So relationships become forms of discipline. If we accept them graciously, we grow. If we do not accept them graciously, we interfere with the development of law and order in our own consciousness as well as in the establishments we maintain. I think, therefore, we have to realize for once and for all in this world that we are not here primarily simply to enjoy ourselves. If that was the plan, the Creator has made a bad botch of it. <laughs> what we are here for, essentially, is to advance some destiny, both within ourselves and within society. We are here because the relationships of life help us to develop our own humanity. It is our form of growth. The natural things, trees and plants, the creatures of the wilderness, are under the constant need for vigilance, are under constant pressure of circumstances. Nature must defend itself against the storms that sweep through the forests defend itself against the tidal wave, the earthquake, must defend itself against all the natural hazards of life. Man has more or less created physical defenses against many of these conditions. Not all, but many. But this does not mean that nature has no plan for him beyond the preservation of his own physical existence. As man solves the mystery of physical existence, he is faced with the greater mystery of psychological existence. He is faced with the need for the development of his own maturity. Now, we cannot say that the world moves in a completely consistent pattern toward growth. There are many interludes, many changes, many occasions which appear to be retrogressive. But out of the whole broad pattern, we know that man is moving inevitably toward self-control, self-direction, self-responsibility, self-discipline. These are the directions that nature wishes him uh, to travel. These are the directions in which lie his hopes for security and peace. And nature, which is always using the same essential technique, having decided what was necessary, no longer permits man to have securities of any kind unless he developed these strength of characters within him, strengths of character within himself. Thus it happens that the individual today must either have the sense of responsibility or suffer. He must discipline himself or find the various things in life which he regards as desirable slipping away from him. So every once in a while, people come in to find out how we feel uh, that uh, they should uh, advance along the road of matrimony. Some are planning it, uh, some are enduring it, some are recovering from it. <laughs> but they're all here for some reason. <laughs> of course, those who are... Enduring it are by far the greater number, for the reason that those who are planning it are not usually philosophical at that time. <laughs> the individual who has no basic subconscious maturity of judgment certainly is not in a good condition to plan a future <clears throat> when he is under heavy emotional stress. At this time, he is suffering from a, usually from a number of defects 
<coughs> for which we have no clear solution. One is suffering from youth, and youth is an experience. In youth, the individual cannot know what he will know 20 or 30 years later. Therefore, in youth, there is only one strength for the individual, and this is the strength that has been taken from him today. This strength is parental example. This strength is the natural experience of growing up in a well-integrated home. If he has this experience, he will develop a subconscious power uh, to direct his own affairs. But if he has lacked this integration in his own growth, he is then hopelessly at disadvantage when the time comes for him to select a marriage partner or attempt to establish uh, a family. Actually, what kind of people work best together? There are two sayings that have come down in astrology that are uh, open, I think, to some discussion. One is the natural attraction of opposites. Uh, we have a feeling today, and I have for a long time, that this attraction of opposites uh, is one of the strongest forces in bringing people together. And from a study of charts, there is much to support this. Very many persons marry individuals uh, who are born under the opposite sign uh, from themselves. Or, whether it is in the month or the hour, in which there are strong oppositions of factors in the charts. Why should opposition or dissimilarity be an attracting power? First of all, it is the attraction of the unknown. Uh, that which is different from ourselves is always intriguing, always in, uh, suggesting some new experience or new advantage. Also, we are all seeking completeness in some way. Psychologically, we sense that the family must confer a certain measure of completeness. We marry someone in the hope of finding a greater and more perfect unity composed of two persons. To do this, it is obvious that whatever be our weaker points, it would be fortunate if the other person was stronger in those points. Whatever might be our uh, areas where we have little insight, it is good if this other person has larger insight. And down through the centuries, when life went along on a reasonably even keel, it did prove extremely valuable for people to complement each other in their abilities and aptitudes. In those days, uh, people had a larger sense of appreciation for certain values than we have now. For instance, the shopkeeper of 17th century England uh, was always rather interested in keeping his religion in his wife's name. Uh, he wanted to contact religion through marriage. He didn't really say it this way. But he, in his business, was not especially devout, yet he sensed the need of devotion. He also wanted his children to be raised with good religious background. And as he was busy buying and selling and keeping shop, he sort of felt that his religious life was related to his home. Therefore, he, he really desired a stronger religious relationship with family. Today, this is a mixed blessing. Because today, the individual who is without religion usually does not want it. The individual who has a narrow interest wants to stay in it. The individual whose judgment is bad in certain matters does not want to be educated. He wants to continue to press his bad judgment to its inevitable disaster. Thus, there is less and less today of interest in this communion of values. We are insulted by persons who know anything we do not know. We are embarrassed if we happen to find a marriage partner who is a little more intellectual than we are. Instead of viewing these as complementary things, they become the basis of a powerful competitive process. So there is a great saying today that what the average person wants to marry is a pleasant, amiable, comfortable non-entity. 
He wants something that will not interfere with himself in any respect. And this is very largely true today of the woman also. She is more and more concerned with the things she wants to do. Uh, she is not inclined to bury herself in family. Uh, she is too well educated. She has had too much business experience, possibly prior to marriage. And she also regards her own feelings, her own attitudes, and her own career as extremely important, valuable things that are not to be compromised. Or if they are compromised, uh, the loss of them may actually lead to a psychological neurotic condition. Uh, today, a woman who is taken out of her natural liberties and forced into too powerful a domestic situation simply becomes ill. She is no longer able to adjust to it in many, many instances. Some do adjust, but again, where this adjustment occurs, it is largely the result of early childhood training, where the person has become aware of the essential values of family and home. So there is a question today as to whether contrasting personalities get along better. Nature seems to like to have it that way because it continually throws them together. It continually makes it uh, an, a, a psychological or magnetic pull between persons who are magnetically polarized, who therefore represent the elements which, if combined in a pleasant chemistry, might result in a happy compound. Obviously, if two persons of similar temperament are both highly developed, both developed to the degree that self-discipline is guiding their courses of action, then they may make powerful contributions to each other because jealousies will not arise, antagonisms and contrasts will not be pointed up, and there will be the skill to handle the other person effectively from a psychological standpoint. But this takes time, it takes thought, it takes effort, and it takes affection. And we very seldom find people today who want to expend all of these things simply upon the comfort, happiness, or convenience of another person. The next point that perhaps arises is what might be termed the clash of basic elemental temperaments. In astrology, the signs of the zodiac are divided into four elemental groups composed of earth, fire, air, and water. And uh, these elements may or may not be compatible. But it is true that as these elements react among themselves as elements, so they will have a tendency uh, to react uh, in the lives of persons uh, born under these signs if they attempt to form relationships. Uh, when, for example, a water sign marries a fire sign, you have here a conflict. And much depends, of course, in the first place upon which of the two is the more positive, uh, better integrated member of the group or at least which one is the more dynamic. It is true that a fire sign can uh, put out uh, too much energy, too much force. This fire sign can dry up water, and water can extinguish fire. A water sign can hurt the person born under the fire element. Hurt this person simply by extinguishing their enthusiasm, pulling down their natural uh, ideals and principles. It is also true that the fiery personality uh, is not compatible or happy for the water person, the water sign. It dries it up, changing the watered area into a desert. A desert in this case simply representing a sterility of enthusiasm or of manifested energies. So each of these uh, groups of elements suggest the effect of people upon each other. They suggest how we have to watch and uh, measure relationships in terms of these factors. 
In astrology, however, there is one factor that is very difficult to determine. And this factor probably can only be determined by an intimate knowledge of the person who is seeking the assistance. And that is the level upon which this person is going to react. All nature is divided into strata in one way or another. We are all upon levels. And uh, these levels uh, represent the degree of value in which various planetary situations will express themselves. Any individual can have any group of planets. Therefore, how he is going to react depends entirely upon the level of his own consciousness and his own integration. All things taken together, therefore, compatibility in marriage, it would seem from experience, depends more upon the levels of relationship than upon the actual positions of planets. If the levels are right, the planets will work out. If the levels are wrong, the planetary expressions cannot come into harmonious relationship. It is therefore rather important for the individual to marry, if possible, within a level in which the other person has had some common experiences uh, uh, with this uh, level uh, as a common denominator. If one person marries uh, an individual who's socially too far removed in levels, there is bound to be additional complications. This is also true increasingly in problems of religion. Uh, religious liberals uh, may intermarry with comparative ease and with very little difficulty on a religious level, and their religious lives will be easily solved. But very intensely devout persons in very conservative faiths seldom do well to marry outside of them. Therefore, if we have a strong religious prejudice, then it is difficult uh, for even the most continuous relationships to overcome this prejudice. The same is true of many other social uh, activity areas. The individual who has certain likes and dislikes must be thoughtful in the selection of a marriage partner whose level of life is somewhat similar, though not identical. This is one of the problems that we always have to face. Another situation that arises in matrimony is the compatibility of age intervals. We know that people who are widely separated in ages have difficulties, but this is again not a clear picture. The reason why it is not a clear picture is because we measure age entirely in terms of the body. Therefore, we say that a man who is 60 who marries a woman who is 40 is probably marrying a woman too young for him. This may be true and it may not be true because it is possible that the man is mentally and emotionally less mature or less old than his years or the woman may be older in qualities of character and consciousness. Well, I've known several instances in which uh, marriages with extremely wide age intervals have been successful, and others where the intervals are very close which were utterly unsuccessful. Again, all human physical problems depend largely for their working out upon the temperaments and attitudes and convictions of the persons involved. It certainly would be an advantage, I think, in the average family if some member of the family had some basic knowledge of astrology. It would not only be helpful in gauging the daily events of life, but would certainly be most useful uh, when the time comes to consider the arrival of new persons as children in a family. It used to be that children were dominated from early life by the strong pressures of family discipline. A well-disciplined family uh, gave support to children at a time when they were unable to give direction to their own emotions and thoughts. 
the child growing up in a secure, well-ordered family received, therefore, a tremendous endowment. He received an early training uh, of obedience, of insight, and of some responsibility. The most successful families were where the children also had their duties to perform, were expected to contribute to the general happiness of the group, and the child was not supposed to start out at an early age on a willful course of complete self-satisfaction. So if the family was strong until the child was 10 or 12 years old, this child had a good deal of basic discipline, and this would be of the greatest value later. Today, however, lacking this discipline and lacking uh, usually uh, the incentives or the willpower to enforce discipline upon children. Many parents are today in a state of complete bewilderment. They are also, many of them, absolutely under the tyranny of their own children. Uh, the child has gotten the upper hand and uh, nothing could be more tyrannical than a small human being with that discovery within his consciousness. So the parent needs some aid, some guide in determining the type of discipline or requirement that a child should have. And the uh, use of the horoscope in determining the nature of the child, its own pressures, its own experiences, its own values, can be extremely helpful to a parent. The horoscopes of children are useful in several ways. First, they help to give us the key to the nature of the personality, which otherwise cannot be discovered until much later in life. Secondly, the chart gives us a certain degree of insight into aptitudes. It helps to direct the child into a proper educational area at a time when the child has no idea as to what it really wants to be or how it expects to get there. The chart further supplies valuable indication as to the health probabilities and the psychological integration of the child. If all these things are taken into consideration by thoughtful parents, they can make some kind of an intelligent project out of directing the child, instead of being in a state of total bafflement. This bafflement leads to despair, despair to indifference, and finally the child is left to its own resources. If the parent really felt that it had a key to the personality of the child, it probably would make a greater effort to understand and direct the child's life. So astrology in this area is particularly valuable. It is also valuable in the effort to determine the relationships of children themselves, between themselves, and to the various other members of an adult community existence. Uh, many cases uh, we know where the child uh, needs a certain sensitive insight. If it does not receive this insight, its future is seriously damaged. There are other children, apparently, who do not sense this need for insight, and get along very well without any help at all. But every so often we come upon what we term normally the neurotic child, and this child does require guidance. And the moment the family finds that it has one of these willful, uh, difficult, dam dominating ch children, where it discovers that the child does not adjust easily, does not work into family patterns, something should be done about it. The average family cannot face the bill resulting from elaborate use of child psychology, but much could be done simply from studying the birthday of that child to find out how it fits in to a vast world of people, many of whom have been born with very similar temperaments and personality problems. It can become a very interesting procedure to try to unfold a child without dominating that child, direct it without destroying its own natural capacities, and inspire it without catering to all of its whims. This is a challenge, and it calls for much more time and thought than the average adult wishes to expend on it at the present time. Now it may also come about that in the course of time two people with comparatively incompatible charts reach a parting of the way. So either together or separately they come in 
to find out what they are going to do about a marriage that has ceased to be important, perhaps has become very difficult. It is interesting to know that in these particular times that we're living in, there is quite an epidemic of divorces among persons who have been married for a long time. Uh, in the last four or five years, we've had an unusual percentage of people who have been married over 20 years and are seeking separation. One would almost think they would have discovered the facts a little earlier along the way, or perhaps, as is uh, not so common but occasionally occurs today, there was the problem of trying to see that the children had reached a degree of self-reliance before the home was broken up. In any event, these people suddenly don't like each other anymore or suddenly become articulate about dislikes that they have maintained over a period of years. Most of them complain that they have reached the breaking point, that they can no longer endure a situation. And yet nine out of ten of them are not very sure as to what the situation is. Uh, this problem of becoming totally fed up. I would suspect from the experiences that I have and some researchers that I have made in statistics, uh, that the fed-up situation is a more common cause of divorce today than infidelity. The individual is not really interested in anyone else, he's mostly interested in himself and the peculiar predicament in which he finds himself involved. Most of these uh, divorces are based now upon one or both persons taking the attitude that they are simply not understood, that every effort they have made to achieve certain common goals or common ends, uh, all these efforts have been rebuffed, that they live with a person who is either indifferent or actually uh, malicious in attitudes or conditions, or a person whose faults, which always existed, have become too obvious to be endured any longer. Well, this type of situation seems to, in most instances, merely be a gradual process of one person waking up to the defects that were always present in the other. There are, of course, cases where the pressure of life has caused major changes in one personality, major but not basic, major in the sense that they have caused the person to use his basic abilities or to emphasize his basic debilities in a particular way. One of the most common problems that we're developing today is the alcoholic marriage partner. Uh, this situation does not mean that somewhere along the line the individual became alcoholic. It means that all the way along the line, the individual was lacking in certain values. That this individual was lacking in the basic integrations of life. The average alcoholic is psychologically immature. Therefore, somewhere along the line, immaturity uh, took a very childish route of escape and became alcoholic. What to do with this type of situation is always difficult. It's one of the hardest problems we have to work with. But if after a reasonable degree of effort uh, there is no improvement, usually it ends in some form of separation as the only honorable solution. And this brings us to another question that has always uh, perturbed some people, and that is, can a divorce be an honorable situation? In our way of life, it certainly can. There were times, perhaps, when uh, it was not really uh, nearly as justifiable as it is today. But under the present pressure of existences, we find that individuals starting out together, say at 21, 22, 25, with approximately the same educational background and the same general uh, family conditioning, uh, begin life with about the same attributes and abilities, interests, um, desires, feelings, beliefs. But there is no way of determining at this time 
how these two persons are going to develop. If they developed together toward home, they would probably build a home. But if the, the, if the instinct toward this union of purposes is not too strong, and in most cases it is not strong today, uh, the marriage is not carefully considered, it is not built upon any clear vision of purpose, therefore it does not have a strong cohesive power. But without this strong integrating factor, which is not probably present, these two persons continue to develop as individuals. And as they go along through life, one develops more rapidly than the other, one develops more positive values, one perhaps develops a stronger ethical conviction, and 25 years after marriage, these two persons have, through the experiences of life, become strangers. They no longer have the same uh, ideals and principles, as far as they can tell, that brought them together in the first place. These ideals and principles have been shadowed and overshadowed and involved in so many complexities that they are no longer recognizable. So that the two individuals are not the persons who married in the first place. And not being the persons who married in the first place, they must meet at uh, after an interval of 25 years, even if they're under the same roof, they must meet again as individuals and decide that they want to be married. If in the course of these years they have become so separate that this interest, this instinct, this value does not arise within them, only one of two or three possible answers can be achieved. One is that in, ca in place of the marriage relation there develops a kindly, tolerant, patient type of friendship. These people may live together because it is easier, more convenient, because they really have nothing against each other, but not very much for each other. Also under those conditions, one or other or both of these persons may drift away from a bond which no longer has any real value. Uh, and seek association with others who are attracted to them or to whom they are attracted by their present condition in society as be, as persons. Uh, the values which have developed over the years may create new interests, new probabilities of relationship. The third problem, of course, is that these changes have gradually hurt. One individual or both may be desperately offended by the changes in the other person. They may find themselves neglected. They may find themselves the victims of everything from mental tyranny to physical cruelty. And under these situations, the problem of breaking up such a relationship is almost uh, inevitable. It has to be faced. It has to be faced because in life, there is no such a situation as one which produces or results in nothing. Every situation must either add something or it will detract something. And in the uh, modern way of life, individuals must always accomplish one of two things to save a shaky marriage. First, they must change themselves to the degree that they can hold that marriage together. Or else they must become sufficiently realistic to sit down together and solve the matter in an amicable and intelligent manner. Uh, all of the emotional pressures and hates which come from the over-delaying of separations should be carefully avoided because they represent only suffering, ultimate suffering, to the person who has the wrong attitude, not to the other person. The next thing we have to realize is that one person cannot save a marriage in, in all or most cases. The complete sacrifice of one individual to the tyrannies of another will not solve the problem. As the uh, marriage service states, marriage is an honorable state. And an honorable state cannot be preserved by dishonorable means. An honorable condition is one in which each individual has his rights and these rights are guarded.
protected, preserved. One individual cannot, by the total sacrifice of their own lives, bring happiness to another person. No one can make anyone else happy. We all have to keep happiness in our own names. And where it is obviously no longer possible for people to be happy, uh, then the security of the individual psychologically and morally demands the solution of the problem. Now, some astrologers working with this problem like to set up charts for marriages. They feel that if they set up a marriage chart, and the chart is fortunate that this is going to help to make a marriage successful. It does help to a degree, but I think that the general way of doing this is not as complete as it should be. I do not think that the main problem is simply to create a time or to select a time by astrology, by an astrological election as it is called, which will in result in an enduring marriage. I have labored with several individuals who had their marriages selected in this way. They complain of one problem, namely that the chart did keep them together, but never made them happy. <laughs> they found they couldn't get apart. They were as though they were stuck on flypaper. <laughs> uh, one way or another, they could not figure a way to separate themselves. Psychologically, they were bound together by some strange uh, pressure from fixed signs or something of that nature, but they weren't really happy. I know at least one or two have spoken to each other for years, but they're still married. The child is holding. A magnificent example of the efficacy of astrological procedure. <laughs> to my thinking, the chart should always be one of a time selected through a reconciliation of the charts of both involved persons. In other words, the time that is best for them both. The time in which the strong points of character have their best opportunity for expression so that the individual can bring to this uh, period of life all that is possible in compatibilities. In other words, the chart should act as a kind of receiving vessel into which both lives should be poured, and it should be a chart which favors both people as far as possible. Now, this isn't always easy, and anyone who works with it will discover another natural law, and that is that there's no such a thing as a perfect chart. There can't be no such a thing as a life also completely protected from all adversities. But the selection of a time which favors the rights, the privileges, the insight, and the values of both persons seemingly is the one which works best for all concerned. Because actually, unless the marriage becomes a union of values, it is not important. Uh, to merely perpetuate a pattern is like trying to perpetuate a home in which the individuals within the home are no longer compatible. So I've always felt that the best way to select these times is through uh, selecting a moment which is most favorable for those who are to be united, in which the present condition at the time of the marriage, the present condition of the heavens, is most favorable to the charts of both persons. This uh, is sometimes a long and involved calculation, but uh, it does often apparently help. We also have a tendency to believe that there are certain hours of the day, certain times which are more appropriate and more purposeful. And the tendency now is to try to select times uh, which are near noon, uh, to bring the sun to the highest exaltation, perhaps with the moon increasing in light, and certainly at a time in which uh, the ascending sign is compatible with both charts. 
uh, of course, you have to be a little careful in having people calculate their own for this particular event for the reason that they have a tendency to pick the time best for themselves and not to be too thoughtful about what is going to happen to the other person. So all these things play into the same general patterns. But out of the whole theory of astrology in connection with marriage, I think we come back primarily to the psychological importance of being able to realize that people are wonderful chemistries of values, that they're not just simply masks in front of a vacuum, that behind each one of these masks is a living person. Our problem is to live with living people, just as they have to live with us. And the best marriage that I know of, one that endured past its diamond jubilee, was one in which each individual admitted frankly that the great formula for the successful marriage was that each person thought first of the good of the other. Keeping their minds off of self-pity and things of this nature, they were able to steer their course more effectively. If young people who are contemplating marriage I can gather up sufficient resource and sufficient uh, self-control to discuss that problem either with a marriage counselor or work with their horoscope, it would undoubtedly reduce a lot of bad marriages. It would give the individual greater insight and give people something to build on. Uh, the study of astrology extends far beyond these particulars and helps to integrate the individual around a philosophy of life built upon natural law, universal procedure, and divine purpose. And any individual who builds a home with a purpose, and that purpose is big enough to bind both persons to a common service, this has the best chance of succeeding. The individual who realizes that there are laws governing his own conduct that he cannot break with impunity that he has responsibilities which he must learn to face, he has obligations which he must meet, and he has wonderful opportunities to share life if he is willing to share honestly and not merely attempt to tyrannize other people. If we could build a deeper philosophy of living under these relationships, they would certainly be more enduring and more valuable. As it is, these too many people come through an unfortunate marriage without really discovering anything important. They develop only antagonisms and antipathies. They do not realize the maturing power of experience on their own souls. They have not permitted themselves to mature under experience, rather they have permitted themselves to be injured by it. So in all these relationships, we are here to grow, we are here to be better people, and we are here to help other people. And there's no place like a home in which to grow, help, share, and serve. And if we meet the problem with this spirit over our actions, then these planetary forces operate in harmony with this purpose. If we remain, however, completely isolated, then these forces work out their patterns in separate ways. So by understanding the charts, by working with them, we can improve the probabilities of a happy and successful life. And we can also gain insight into the guidance and directing of the next generation. These things make the subject very valuable, and I'm not at all uh, uncertain about the future of the general field. I believe within 50 years, astrology will be commonly used in many of these areas where either now there is nothing or a very involved psychological process which the average person cannot afford. So if uh, uh, the individual in the home wishes to take up a subject of this nature, it probably would do a great deal of good for all concerned. Well, our time is up, so we have to stop.